everyone, this is BTEC Psychology um, and in this video, which is Unit 3 Health, we're looking at Section B3, which is Gambling, and we're looking at the Cognitive Approach of Gambling. Now, the Cognitive Approach of Gambling looks all at how our thought processes um, affect our addiction for anything that's cognitive. And in the case of gambling, um, the idea is that gamblers get addicted to gambling because of cognitive distortions, in other words, because of faulty thought processes that they possess um, about, um, about gambling and about probability and about the way that gambling works. And so they end up addicted. So let's have a look at how that would work in real life. Okay, so the first thing, the first way we look at this is by initiation. How does the addiction start? Um, and in somebody who is getting addicted to gambling, it may be because what they've done is done what's known as a cost benefit analysis, where you weigh up the pros and cons of doing something. Um, and you, you, there's some examples here on this page. Um, things that are good about gambling potentially are that it might be enjoyable, you might win a feeling of contr control potentially. Uh, whereas we'd weigh up on the other hand that th our reasons not to gamble would be because we might well lose money and it could, that could then cause anxiety. So for most of us, um, we would weigh those things up and maybe decide that the financial losses is too much of a risk. But for someone who's become addicted to gambling, it may be that they've thought about that in a less rational way and maybe dismissed financial losses, thought, oh, that won't happen to me. There'll be some sort of, of issue in the way that they could have weighed up whether gambling was a good idea or not. Um, and then an, a gambling addiction may be maintained, remember how the addiction continues, um, through different cognitive biases. Um, <clears throat> so the cognitive theory would say that um, one way in which cognitive bias occurs, it would be via something called a near miss bias, um, where if your horse comes second in a race, you don't perceive that as, oh, I lost, which you did because you lost your money, um, but you might perceive it as, uh, for example, oh, I nearly won, so I was really close. You were almost the excitement of being second kind of almost makes you think about it in terms of having been a, almost to win. So it's a different way of thinking about it rather than thinking of, of it as a loss. You're biased towards a favourable outcome. You're perceiving it to be more of a favourable outcome than it actually was. Um, and other ways in which biases and distortions keep someone gambling. One example is, is gambler's fallacy, which is a misunderstanding about how probability works. So, for example, if you have a dice roll and the number four comes up several times in a row, uh, you might be less likely to gamble, uh, to put your, your money on a four for the next one um, because you think, oh, well, we've just had it lots. It's less likely to come up the next time. But actually, that's not true. It's the same likelihood every single single time always one in six if you're just rolling a normal dice so that um gambler's fallacy is is an illusion that can kind of keep you gambling because you think oh i might win this time because i have more of an idea about what's going to come up next actually you've got just as much idea as you had on the first time um then another way that our gambling is maintained would be through illusions of control someone may um have the illusion that they're exerting some control over what's happening whether whether that's via superstitions, they carry a mascot, they have a lucky number, um, or like if they're just really willing something to happen, that that'll help. Um, so uh, there'll be many different kind of small ways in which someone may think that they're exerting control, even if it's like choice over which game they do next. Um, and so that's a big thing that keeps someone gambling. If they think they have control, then they're more likely to keep going. And then relapse can occur. Um, so, for example, if someone is trying to, to uh, quit gambling and they think back to what it was like, so they may have something called recall bias, where they remember really well things that they won on. They re might remember their successes, but they've sort of selectively forgetting their losses. So that's known, uh, again, it's a distorted or faulty cost-benefit analysis, where they're thinking, should I? Should I do it again? Well, actually, there was that really great time. We'll just forget all of those other bad times. So there, it's, a, it's another faulty thought process that's been identified in, in people who are addicted to gambling. 
OK, so we've looked at what the cognitive approach says about the causes of gambling. Let's look at, at whether this is true or not. So our first strength of this theory is that if we change the way somebody who is addicted to gambling thinks about it, i.e. we change their cognitions, their thought processes, then that actually does reduce gambling. If you can use that to identify um, faulty thought processes someone has about gambling and correct them, then they're, they they will gamble less. So that suggests that they are having an influence on gambling behaviour. And there's a study in your textbook about that if you want further details. Um, the weakness of this theory, the main weakness, is that lots and lots of people have these same cognitive biases. You may well have identified that you have faulty thought processes around gambling as part of watching this video. However, um, many, many people who have these biases don't gamble and very very few people who start gambling end up addicted uh, only one to three percent although don't let that lull you into a false sense of security um, but yeah so if this was the only explanation we would expect a lot more addicted gamblers so there must it might be that cognitive um, factors are part of the explanation but uh, that there's something else having a major impact as well um, the last part of your evaluation is to have a read about this study. Griffiths uh, ran a study about fruit machines, which is a really fascinating study. Um, and it's what he did was he got people who were addicted to gambling to play on fruit machines um, and to verbalise everything they were thinking. So they were talking out loud anything that went through their head. And it's a really fascinating study where you can see exactly the sorts of things that people are thinking. And it backs up this theory quite a lot because there were a lot of things that they said that were rational like statements like um, this is so frustrating or I need an orange to win but there were also many many statements that they were making that weren't rational where you can see things like in, in these statements where they're treating the machine like a person that's called personification where you can see things like this machine hates me um, on this slide here as an example that's not rational because the, a fruit machine is not a person and they don't have a particular point of view about anyone that's playing them um, and there's other things as well there that you can see such as illusions of control I'm going to bluff this machine um, so it's a really interesting study where you can see many of these different sorts of irrational statements backing up the idea that people who are addicted to gambling, these irrational thought processes are playing at least a role in maintaining their behaviour. Okay, that's all folks. <laughs>